Awesome. And share my screen before I do that. Can you give me a thumbs up or tell me if you see my screen? Looks great. Awesome, awesome. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone. This is a special event with our Deep Learning Adventures Meetup. We wanna welcome Dan, Rachel and Ryan, as well as people from all around the country and all around the world joining us tonight. We'll talk a little bit about data science, deep learning, machine learning, and all the fun and cool stuff that we usually talk about. But really the goal is to get to know each other a little bit better, especially our panelists here. Uh, what cool projects they've worked on in the past or are currently working on and you know, what was their experience doing this awesome adventure that we took called Kaggle Learn. Uh, again, welcome Dan, Rachel, and Ryan. Um, just some thank you notes to this amazing collaborative effort that cross-posted this event. Um, uh, apart from Deep Learning Adventures, which I'm a co-organizer along with my great friends, David and Robert, we were lucky enough to be cross-posted on Bethesda uh, Artificial Intelligence Meetup, which is another group in the DC area. Um, the San Diego Machine Learning, which is on the West Coast, they, they're doing a great job with uh, going over a data applications book, as well as Kaggle competition uh, discussions. The Machine Learning Paper Club, um, it started in the DC area now, but uh, we have members from all around the country as well, where we pick a paper, we take a deeper dive, uh, more from an academic perspective, and Pick, you know, learn more on the latest news of, of machine learning and deep learning. And data education, DC and Upskill ML, these are two, again, DC-based meetups that are doing a great job democratizing uh, data science and, and learning. And statistical seminar DC as well is more of a statistical approach to, to learning, which is also a local meetup as well. So thank you to all the co-organizers and, 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 and event hosts for, for cross-posting and looking forward to having more collaborations in the future. Just a little bit about our meetup. Um, I wanted to throw some, some pictures from our life, hashtags live ch Slack channel, just to get an idea of the fun things that we do. We like to travel. We have members who like to go mountain biking. We have people who like to explore the, uh, the beautiful mountains. We have somebody here who has two beautiful guinea pigs right behind me joining us tonight. Um, we like to cook, we like to make amazing pumpkin recipes. Uh, that's one of my favorites. Sometimes we go on a tour, we give each other a tour of the city we're in, and our latest adventure is playing with deploying models on the edge, like our phone or, or different edge devices. Um, today we're gonna to talk about um, Kaggle Learn and um, some of the great uh, work that uh, Dan, Ryan, and Rachel have put together and their teams as well. Um, get some advice from them on you know, data science in general from a learning perspective as well as from a career perspective and um, you know, just have a, a good, good discussion. So that's all the slides I have. I'm gonna stop sharing uh, at this point. I'll ask, um, let's start with Dan to uh, say a few words about himself, introduce himself and again, welcome Dan. Yeah, um, so let's see a few words about myself. I've been really closely involved with Kaggle for a long time in uh, 2011 or 2012, I did not think of myself as a data scientist, but um, competed and became really um, very, it was spent a lot, a huge amount of time on a um, competition in the early days of Kaggle. Uh, when I first submitted to it, I was using classical statistical techniques and it was in approximately, not exactly last place, but approximately last place. Um, over the course of that competition, learned a lot about machine learning, ended up finishing in second place. It was a competition with a $3 million prize for first place, but unfortunately no prize for second place. So um, maybe have mixed emotions about that, but uh, as a result was able to get a job doing um, data science consulting, did a lot of consulting for, I think, I think I've consulted for six companies in the Fortune 100. Um, worked briefly at Kaggle, was an early employee at Data Robot, which is a Auto ML tool, which is now um, a quite big company, but at the time was pretty small. Uh, and then uh, about four years ago, went to work at, at Kaggle. And uh, that was, you know, Kaggle Learn didn't exist at the time. And um, the, the thing that I spent most of my time on at Kaggle was creating Kaggle Learn. Uh, in January of 2020, I left Kaggle and started a, created a startup, which is um, 
maybe I'll, I'll depending on what the questions are, I'll, it'll come up again later, but it's just trying to help uh, people who build machine learning models actually go from, I've got a prediction to what do I do about that prediction? So you might have a, um, a machine learning model that says, what's the probability that a given transaction is fraud? Let's say the result is it's 7% likely to be fraud. Okay, what do you do about that? That's gonna depend on potentially a lot of other things about, the, about that financial transaction. And so if you think of that as we want a rule for how do we use our machine learning models, uh, the thing that, that, we're, that I'm focused on these days is helping uh, data scientists understand the implications of different rules they might use so that they not only build predictive models, but they use them to accomplish broader goals. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was very interesting. Rachel, how about you? Do you like saying a few words about yourself and um, where you're now and how, what was maybe a few words about Kaggle Learn and your experience there? Yeah, definitely. So I uh, went to Kaggle right out of graduate school. So I had my PhD in linguistics and my graduate work was really focused on um, computational sociolinguistics and how language use reflects um, language use and perception reflects um, social identity in um, various ways. Uh, and while I was at Kaggle, I was involved with uh, a number of different things. Um, I helped write some of the learning courses. Um, probably the thing I did that, I mean, it's been a while, but I did a, a bunch of sort of um, live events. Um, so with live streams and having um, exercises that you would do like at a specific point in time. Uh, and actually somebody just reached out to me. It's like, is it starting in March? And I was like, Ugh, March 2018, <laughs> it was a while ago. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed Kaggle. And uh, actually also in January, 2020, I started at Rosna, which is good. Let me share it on. We have an open source framework for building conversational AI systems. So chatbots, virtual assistants. Um, and I've been involved there both with uh, some work with the research team on you know, NLP research in that space, uh, but also I'm a developer advocate. So I do a lot of work in um, developer education and I do a lot of YouTube videos. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. That was great. Uh, Ryan, how about yourself? Would you like saying a few words by yourself and what are you currently um, toying with and what was your experience with Kaggle Learn? Yeah, um, yeah, so I joined Kaggle uh, back in uh, March, um, so end of March, and then uh, it was perfect timing because that was when everything started shutting down. And you know, um, uh, before then, uh, I had been uh, a math lecturer at a university here in uh, Oklahoma, where I am for uh, about 10 years. Um, and then in uh, school, I, uh, my degrees are in mathematics. Uh, I had been interested in machine learning and, and, and that kind of stuff for a long time and kind of kept up with it. Um, and then uh, I just happened to see a, a, that they were looking for um, someone to join the learn team on uh, their discussion forum and um, sent in an application and, and just got lucky. And so I had um, been there, uh, so I guess about nine months now. So it's been really great. Awesome. Thank you. Um... Just to get some, some more introductions here, I'll ask uh, some of my community members to maybe say a few words about themselves, but I'll let, hand it over to David and Robert, my co-organizers, and then I'll ask our friends, Aspeta, Alana, and Leana, and Luis, just to say a few words about themselves and their experience with our meetup, just so that people have an idea of our community and uh, what we have been uh, uh, doing for the last three months during this Kaggle Learn venture. So David, how about you? Sure, so uh, I'm David Patton. I am a PhD in physics, but I've been working as a data scientist and right now work for a healthcare company. Um, and uh, new George, as George said, I'm a co-organizer with, along with Robert and have been uh, known them before this group even started. So good friends with them. Just go ahead. Cool, Robert, how are you? Sure. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Robert. Uh, in addition to George and David, I'm also a data scientist in the DC area. Uh, like David, I also came from physics background. And uh, the three of us actually met each other at a deep learning working group event um, probably two years ago, at least now, maybe even three, I can't remember, uh, where we were working through uh, systematically each week, we'd cover new modules of Andrew Eng's uh, deep learning specialization 
and uh, you know all of us were looking to uh, incorporate more knowledge about these topics into our own career endeavors. Um, so when I when I found out that George was uh, looking to uh, looking to uh, make a splash here during the pandemic and uh, and start a group, I, I jumped on board wholeheartedly. So then it's been a, it's been a lot of fun uh, organizing these events uh, with this team and uh, learning a lot of new things along the way. Awesome, thank you, Robert. Well, let's hear some from some other community members so people have an idea of um, you know who we are and what we do. Um, Alana, let's start with you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, hi, I'm Alana, and um, yeah, I'm I'm glad that they started the group because um, yeah, it allowed for me to kind of jump on and sort of go along along the ride with folks. Um, it's been really it's been really nice to be able to watch and um, participate somewhat in some of these like the Kaggle you know coding adventures and some of the other stuff too because it's just sort of fills out um, with a, a community you know the idea of like well I want to have a project or I want to work on something or I want to you know kind of broaden my knowledge of the way things are working like right now currently too with, like the tools that are available and so it's really um, it's been a really helpful just you know practical thing to be able to do in in my spare time kind of being I'm new to the machine learning world too so I, I really appreciate that a lot cool thank you Lana Aswetha how about yourself yeah hi yeah can you hear me yes yes yeah okay welcome guys um, my name is Aswetha uh, just uh, I was in teleco industry back in home but uh, this last three years of working at the machine learning. Basically, this uh, community is great. You know, it's a bridge you know, to connect you with the uh, technologies in the data science. So as a community, as well as, you know, shape you how to work together. So I believe it's uh, contributing a lot, you know, in, a, in learning from the society as well as from the, you know, from the Kaggle. So it's great to be here and uh, always, I'm feeling good. Thanks for joining us again. Liana, how about yourself? Hey, yeah, uh, my name's Liana. I'm in the Seattle area. Uh, I've been coming to these sessions since I think about September last year. Um, and been to a few meetups, but I definitely gravitated to this one and probably honestly felt most comfortable in this one. Everyone's extremely welcoming. Um, I love the diversity in the topics in this group. Um, sometimes uh, there are guest speakers doing deep dives, sometimes the doing the Kaggle competitions or the Coursera. Um, so that's that's been really fun getting that sort of uh, hands-on experience as a group. Also get to meet a lot of people who are experts in all of these different fields. So whenever you have a question, you know who your go-to person is for X, Y, and Z. Um, so that's, that's that's really awesome too, and to just sort of follow the discussions that happen both here and on the Slack. And yeah, it's been it's been really fun getting to know everyone and, and participating. Awesome. Thank you. And Luis, last but not least, uh, do you mind saying a few words about yourself? Okay. Hello, hi everyone. And my name is Luis. I'm from Peru. I'm Peruvian, Latin America. So I work at the university as coordinator of social projects and volunteer programs. And now I've been working in two social coding pro projects, teaching Python and someone analyzing data of COVID-19. And I really like these lectures, all the discussions here, the different approach to solving problems or exercise, or exercise that are given in the courses here, especially on the Kaggle competitions or Kaggle courses. And furthermore, as Alana said, uh, I like this group because there is a lot of, uh, you feel at home and I feel at home. You know, people here are so friendly and energetic and everyone who attends this here is very cool. Great, thanks. Thanks, Luis. So I think I'll start uh, going back to our, our guests tonight and um, ask them, you know, what what it was like developing these courses and we've enjoyed them very much, but just give us some feedback on, on uh, why the courses were selected and maybe give us some hints if you know of uh, what's in the future for, for Kaggle courses and Kaggle Learn. Any of you want to take that? 
Yeah, I, I can't talk about the future. I, I suspect only Ryan, of the three of us, only Ryan is probably able to do that. Um, you know, my goal when I started the first Kaggle course was that, it, so when Kaggle first started, first data science was just a, a much smaller field, but there was a period of time when you couldn't go and get like a data science degree or even find um, a data science curriculum. And so most of the people who came through Kaggle a long time ago were people who were sort of autodidacts and wanted to just learn by doing and figure, figure things out. And that's not everyone, but it was for a period of time, a, a really, a, a way that a lot of people learn very effectively through Kaggle. Um, some of us were able to translate that into professional success, but that typically came because people did well in competitions. And to turn your Kaggle results into a job, like you really in practice need to be in the top, I don't know, one or 2%. And tautologically, that's just not most people who come to the site. And so the challenge was, how do we make something so that people who want to learn for themselves or, or want to sort of learn by doing and, and run experiments and, and, um, and yeah, and, and sort of get started quickly and then figure things out on their own. How do we make it so that that works for not just 1% of people, but for most people who come to the site? Um, you know, in contrast, there are a lot of great courses. Uh, someone talked about Andrew Ng's course. So that's a course for people who um, want to learn a bunch of theory. And you might get through that course and not be sort of self-directed even after months of learning. And so the, the, the thing that we really strived for in the, in the early days of Kaggle Learn is like, how do I make something that's interactive, it's you know four hours or so, which is what a lot of our courses are. And at the end of that, you don't know everything. You in some ways know like less theory than almost any other course on the internet, but you know enough that you can sort of like play around with deep learning or you know enough that you can join a, a machine learning competition and play around with um, scikit-learn and like experiment with models um, and use everything else that's on the site. And you know, the site has, a, you know, 10,000 10, data sets or something like that. So um, yeah, I, I wanted people to be able to learn a way which was also a way that I learned of like, just teach me enough that I can start being self-directed. And that was always the goal. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, I think it's re resonated with a lot of people. There are a lot of people for whom it's not the ideal way to learn, but um, I was excited to create something that I thought was sort of different from the other courses out there. Yeah, and I'm remembering a lot of the, the discussions that Dan and I had about sort of uh, what it meant to be a Kaggle Learn course as opposed to, I don't know, I guess the, for me, there's of, of course Andrew Ng's course, but I always think about, um, you know, when I was starting out, if you asked a question about machine learning, people would be like, oh, go check out, what is it, um, elements of statistical learning? Uh, and like you flip to any random page and there it's covered in Greek letters. Um, if you don't have like a really rigorous math background, it can be uh, really intimidating. And my sort of, because um, Blurred was sort of uh, Dan's, I'm trying to think of a word other than baby. <laughs> uh, the spark of life came from Dan uh, for the, the courses as they continued forward. Um, and when I was putting things together, I um, I mean, I taught a lot of in-person courses in, in graduate school and I uh, worked with the software carpentries. Now it's just the carpentries. Um, uh, folks a lot. So I'd had quite a bit of, of in-person teaching and also I'd been doing some live streaming and sort of got some some feedback from uh, community. I think I saw Ryan somewhere in the um, um, the thing who, who would often tune into the live streams. So when I'm putting, was sitting down and putting together a course, I had to think about, okay, what do people actually absolutely need to be able to do? What are their main learning goals? And then drawing on my experience, talking to people and sort of where they tend to go off course as they're working towards that learning goal, getting ahead of those places where people will develop misconceptions or, you know, anti-patterns um, or, uh, you know, start to do things like, say, tuning the random seed, which I know is a little bit controversial in the Kaggle community, but I would say it's not a good best practice to take with you into your bag of tricks for the rest of your life. Um, so, yeah, it was really a dialogue between these very goal-oriented, want to be able to do things, you know, um, and carrying it down to brass tacks, but at the same time, because you're not in a one-on-one -on -one course situation, how do you make sure that everyone can follow along um, 
in a way that's also not too verbose. It is a tricky, tricky balancing act. Right. <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. So it's really interesting to uh, hear the kind of the origin story there of uh, of, of Lauren. So, um, but yeah, it's uh, it's been super successful. One of the um, most popular parts of Kaggle, I think. Uh, so along with um, you know, uh, the competitions and, and data sets and everything else. It's one of the reasons that uh, people come to Kaggle. Uh, and I think that uh, kind of as uh, Dan and Rachel were talking about, it's the um, kind of the experience that can help bring people into the uh, rest of um, the, the, the Kaggle ecosystem. Um, like maybe the uh, competitions feel kind of intimidating or they've never worked with um, notebooks or haven't done um, any like big projects before. Um, so we really tried to focus on, well, how can we um, get people quickly like making stuff on their own? Um, and so really focus on like applications and um, like getting people to, uh, you know, like independently explore uh, things that they might be interested in. Um, so yeah, we've, uh, we've talked a lot about that and we're um, trying to uh, kind of develop new stuff in, in that direction too. Um, and I'm really excited about it. Um, let's see, currently, uh, for the future, um, we have, uh, I have a, a feature engineering course coming out the 10th, uh, so that's in a couple weeks. Um, and then uh, Alexis, who is the um, heading Learn Now, uh, she is going to have an AI ethics course coming out uh, sometime this quarter, I think. Um, and then uh, I think next up is going to be a time series for me. Um, so that'll probably be um, you know, a few months into the future. Awesome, Robert. Awesome. Uh, yeah, that was really interesting to hear to hear that uh, answer about this, the story of the history behind um, the uh, the product. And I will I will speak as someone who uh, you know when we started this deep learning adventure into the Kaggle courses, um, I, I started looking looking at them and was like you know it, it kind of shows you how to do things, but uh, you know where, are you really going to start to develop the understanding from these courses? But at the same time, uh, in retrospect, I have found these courses perhaps even more useful than the other ones that are more deep into the theory because it's a perfect reference and I know exactly where to go. Uh, you know, just today I needed to do something in uh, GeoPandas and my go-to was, uh, I know exactly where in the Kaggle course that was. So, so that's... Uh, um, and, and I share uh, I share Rachel's observation about the uh, the uh, challenges of uh, you know someone tells you to, uh, to to learn something and you know go to some uh, some uh, statistical learning text uh, you know, tip tips around it G great great work but uh, not not for someone who who's only got thirty minutes to, to, and, and doesn't have the have the math background uh, I myself remember being directed by colleagues to uh, do to heart and stork and some other um, you know textbooks uh, really deep on on the subject um, but uh, it's super useful as a reference anybody who hasn't taken the taken the courses that is a uh, reason in and of itself really it's just a just a great reference to have uh, I'd like to uh, to move the conversation to uh, to what you all are working on currently uh, what 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 uh, I know a uh, I know Dan and Rachel have uh, both both moved on to new endeavors within the last year or so, and uh, we're all excited to to hear about uh, about what what is exciting you professionally these days. I'll go, I'll go first. Um, yeah, you know. So let's see. Pretty soon after I started at Kaggle, I was talking to a friend of mine. He worked for a large U.S.-based airline. Uh, the number one, the most important problem that you work on if you're at an airline is, uh, and you're a data scientist, is how do we set prices? So if you were to build a machine learning model for setting prices, a quite, you know, you could, let's just take a moment and brainstorm, like what, if I'm going to use machine learning, like what would be my prediction target? Um, they set, they update prices daily. And so a quite reasonable thing to predict is, um, how many tickets, if I give the model the price, how many tickets could I sell in a 24 hour period? Okay, so let's say you build that model, which is in fact a the model they built. And uh, then someone says, all right, 
you've got this predictive model, what price should I actually set? Now, if you've got one day before the flight takes off and I say, all right, I can basically use this model, I can effectively like trace out a demand curve. And I say, you could sell three tickets for $400 or five tickets for $200, like which of those is better? Well, I could just do multiplication. Like that's actually a pretty easy problem. But let's say I've got 90 days before the flight takes off. Then someone says you can sell three tickets for price X or four tickets for price Y or five tickets for price Z. Like which of those is better? There's this really complex dynamic optimization problem. Um, you know, especially if you think the price that we set today is gonna influence what our competitor sets tomorrow. And so he was, he said that they were really just unable to go from, we've got a model, it makes predictions to, in this case, the thing they actually control is their price. They, and the thing they're trying to achieve is, is make as much revenue as possible. They just had no framework for going from, we've got a model that makes predictions to what should we actually do? Um, in fact, he's no longer with that company because uh, they were unable to, his team is no longer no longer even exists because they were uh, unable to, to solve that problem. And I talked to a lot of these data scientists and in contrast to what you see, you know, you do a Kaggle problem, you build a model, it makes predictions, you submit it to the leaderboard, that's the end. Or um, you read a textbook, it tells you how to build a model. Maybe it says, hey, you can look at the validation or cross-validation score, that's the end. The In practice, there's almost always extra work to be done from we built a model, it makes predictions to, all right, what do we actually do? And if you can't translate it into what, actually, what you actually do, then your model is, I, I'm going to say we're zero and it sounds like I'm being sort of exaggerating, but I actually mean literally, unless you can turn it into decisions, the predictions are worthless. Um, and so that's something that I see all the, I saw all the time. I spent a lot of time saying, all right, how do we be as rigorous in going from predictions to decisions as we were in just going from raw data to predictions. Um, and uh, yeah, and, and um, I came up with an approach that I think most data scientists should be using. Um, frequently it, it involves building multiple models and embedding some domain knowledge that isn't embedded in models because in practice for any real business problem, there are some parts of the business where the best knowledge is not something that's stored like in a database. You just have to actually walk over to the marketing guy and say, hey, what are you guys gonna do next quarter? And then he tells you, and then you sort of write it out as an equation. So we, we've built software for data scientists so that they can take multiple models, they can take other domain knowledge that they can describe in a, a somewhat mathematical sense. And now in this, in this I'm gonna call it simulation environment, test out different decision rules they're considering and see what's the bottom line impact of, of any of those. So um, this is a, a piece of software that um, we've built. It's a web-based app. Um, you Part of it is you just import your scikit-learn or TensorFlow or, or XGBoost models. Um, and then there's a, a domain-specific language for how you go the next step from that. Um, and the, the primary thing I'm spending my time doing is trying to convince people of the need and the possibility to go a step further and do what I call decision optimization instead of sort of prediction optimization, which is how I would describe most of what's done in machine learning. I'll take the floor. Um, so I'm, uh, I was a developer advocate at Kaggle and I'm, I'm still a developer advocate and I'm very focused on, on developer um, education. And the, the sort of the big thing that I'm thinking about these days is, um, so Raza, um, as a platform, we are a very machine learning forward way of doing dialogue systems. So sort of traditionally a dialogue system is um, a state machine, you build you know, a decision tree, like here's how the, the conversation can go, people can do this or that. You've probably used a system like that, particularly the ones like um, you would do over the phone and you, you'd enter numbers to go through the tree. Um, and the, the thing that I think is pretty easy for most folks to get is, um, that at each turn when somebody does something, you run a multi-class classifier over some set of uh, text examples and you figure out what it is that they're trying to do from a set of things that you can handle somebody trying to do. So that's intent classification. Um, and we are slowly going away from that um, as the only way of doing things, but 
that one's pretty straightforward. Because of the state machine, um, sort of like background radiation in terms of people's understanding of dialogue systems. Um, I have a lot of education work to do in how the, the Raza way of doing things is. So we have um, a, an ensemble policy to pick what to say next. Um, and the ways that you train the policy is you provide examples of structures of conversations. Um, and so one of the policies is just like, uh, if the conversation is following the flow of an example that you provided, keep doing that. Um, another policy can be like, hey, every time somebody asks to buy alcohol, uh, we have a rule that checks with their ages. And if they're not 21 in the US, um, say no, and immediately stop that part of the, the conversation. Um, and then we have a, a transformer driven policy. And the uh, the big education challenge for, for me um, is going from a system where people are super familiar with building out dialogue trees and doing everything rule-based to beginning to bring in more of um, machine learning ethos. And I do work with a lot of machine learning engineers and like they know what's up and that's that's always a pretty easy conversation to have. But I also work with a lot of people who have a much more traditional software development background who are maybe working on these voice systems, who have been doing dialogue systems for a while and sort of helping them develop those intuitions about you know, how the data distribution is going to affect something um, is you know, an area of ongoing challenge and growth. Ryan, how about you? Yeah. Um... Well, uh, so what I've um, just finished up working on is the uh, feature engineering course that uh, we'll have coming out in a couple of weeks. Um, and so this turned out to be uh, a lot more challenging to write than I was expecting it to be. Um, I, I discovered as I was developing the course that um, there's not kind of a, a predefined curriculum for feature engineering like there is for a lot of other subjects where you could uh, you know, find in a textbook or you look at different courses and there's usually um, a lot of agreement there. Uh, there are um, some pretty good references, but they all tend to cover uh, different subjects. Um, and so I spent a lot of time thinking about uh, like what kinds of things would people um, want to know or would be useful for someone who is uh, uh, coming at this for the first time and also coming up with uh, some techniques people could use um, that were uh, general enough to uh, apply to most kinds of problems and that would really um, kind of direct people through the, um, through the thought process and through the uh, complete workflow. Like how do you integrate this uh, feature engineering with the, um, like the rest of a, a machine learning uh, project? Um, yeah, so I, think, uh, so I think it's gonna be uh, pretty good. I'm real excited about it. Um, we go through uh, kind of the uh, like discovering features, like trying to figure out which features are going to be useful. Um, and then some different uh, transformations uh, that you can use just like in pandas for one. Um, and then uh, testing them using like cross validation say, uh, to figure out which kinds of new features are gonna be useful. Um, and then we do some, uh, uh, some uh, creating features with uh, unsupervised models like uh, principal component analysis and uh, k-means clustering. Um, and then we also do a, uh, a cool kind of uh, category encoding uh, called target encoding. Um, and we sort of talk about the uh, dangers of um, like data leakage that go along with that and some of the ways to, um, some of the ways to avoid it. Um, and then we also are going to have a, a, a bonus project go along with it that um, is a, a feature engineering for our uh, house prices competition. Um, so one of our getting started competitions, a uh, regression uh, problem for uh, house prices. Um, and so over the, the, uh, the lessons in the course, um, you'll, uh, in the exercises, do feature engineering for that data set. Um, and then in our bonus lesson, it'll bring it all together. Um, and after you finish, you'll have a, um, like a strong project that you can use to um, get started on uh, um, this competition on your own. So yeah, I think it'd be really cool. Awesome, thank you, Ryan, very interesting. Uh, let's switch gears a little bit. I'm gonna tackle this next question from, uh, um, from a persona perspective. Let's say somebody is pretty new in um, data science or machine learning or deep learning, and he or she wants to either improve their skills or maybe try for entry-level career uh, into data science or machine learning. Um, 
what resources do you recommend people follow? What methodology do you think people follow? I mean, no, Kaggler is a great start. Um, you know, there's a bunch of resources there, YouTube, Coursera, Udacity, you know, there's so many resources out there. How, how, how doesn't somebody get, how does somebody get a good start and doesn't get overwhelmed with the plethora of, of options out there? Um, either for improving their skills or, or for looking for maybe an entry level or internship level uh, role in data science. Um, Rachel, why don't we start with you since we have you for a few more minutes. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna have to bounce early, unfortunately. Um, yeah, so I guess a couple pointers I would give you would be A, give yourself a time frame for how long you're going to spend taking introductory courses. Um, I think it's good to start with some sort of introductory material, whether that's a course, whether that's a book that guides you through it. Um, and after that, I would start working on a project because um, at least I find for, for hiring managers, what tends to be very compelling to them is that you have done the job they are hiring you to do. Uh, so find something like if you're doing an analysis project, something you really want to know the answer to. If you're doing a machine learning project, um, something that builds something that you need or want in your everyday life, you're gonna be motivated to work on. Um, and uh, once you've finished your, your time frame, maybe like a month, maybe two months, I, it depends on how much free time you have, um, then start working on your project. And as you work on your project, you'll probably reach a point where you're like, oh, I need to do X and I don't know how to do that. Let me go figure out how to do that. Um, and I would also do, do a plug um, that I wanna say Emily Robinson and Heather Nolis, it might be Jacqueline Nolis, one of the Nolises, and definitely Emily Robinson have a book uh, about getting started in data science and data science careers. I'll post a link in the chat um, that is fantastic um, and is more on the, the practical side of getting a job. Got it. Thank you. That was very useful. And how about you from your perspective? Yeah, I, I apologize if this background is. I've got both a, a crying kid in the background and my, uh, my mouse has has stopped working, so I can't mute and unmute myself easily. Um, yeah, I mean, first of all, I 100% agree with everything that Rachel said. Um, you know, uh, I guess, what else do I have to add beyond that? I, I think she summed up pretty well. Um, I guess the, the two, the, the small comment I would add is when you do a project um, and having hired a bunch of, of data science folks, one thing that you can do, which has a huge ROI is, uh, if you send me a if you send me a resume, I probably won't even read the full resume. But if I see a GitHub link, I'm going to click on it. I'm going to look at your GitHub um, profile. Uh, something that uh, something that has a huge ROI is making your README file, you know, like README.md, make that really nice. Like ideally, have some graphics or like a summary of your project because that's something that's going to pull me in. And like we get so many resumes that um, I'm not going to like go deep in your code if I can't immediately tell what the project does. But when you get something that has a, a readme and has like graphs and just shows something interesting, it really like is memorable, it pulls you in. So that that's a high, a super valuable um, thing to do and it's typically pretty quick. Um, you know, unfortunately, probably the fastest way to learn is to have a job where you're actually doing data science. Uh, the reasons for that are one, however much time you spend doing data science outside of work. Like if we add eight hours a day to that, okay, that's uh, that's a big bonus. Um, and then the other part is that you'll have people at work typically who are who are more experienced, who are then going to give you feedback and then and feedback and conversation is just really valuable. So um, anything that you can do to Maybe it's you've got a job and it's not a data science job, but sometimes you can do some analytics, whether it's SQL or Python. Like if you can start to find a way to do Python or any type of data science or R, I know, sorry, sorry, Rachel, um, R or Python or SQL um, on the job. Um, yeah, I, I guess that would be beyond the, thing that, the things that she said, which I totally agree with, um, would be find a way to, to get some work experience get paid for your time learning and uh, the readme. Awesome, thank you, Dan. How about you, Ryan? <clears throat> yeah, uh, I think for the most part, I'm probably just gonna uh, repeat what uh, Rachel and Dan said. Um, so I think there's uh, uh, the most valuable thing that you can do for yourself, both for learning and then also for uh, employment is just to uh, make things and then um, and, and put them out there. So. 
uh, you know, Dan mentioned putting projects on GitHub. Uh, I think that's really valuable. Um, if you've got some code or a notebook or anything like that, um, you know, put make yourself a repository, make it look nice, put it on, on GitHub. Um, or, you know, like having a blog or, or something like that, I think can be really, um, really good too. Um, so I, whenever I'm learning something new, um, I really like to uh, write about it. That, that helps me to, to, to think through it. Um, and so uh, I have a blog where I write articles about stuff whenever I'm learning about something new. Um, so I think that's a great way to learn about something. Uh, make a project or write an article or, or something like that. Um, yeah, and I think, uh, you know, as far as learning goes, I don't think there's one right way to do it, but really just whatever works for you. Um, I sort of just throw myself into it and read as much as I can about everything. And, um, you know, sometimes it, I, I get it right and sometimes I don't, so. <laughs> Got it. So let, let me um, slightly change the persona that we were looking at. Sorry, before we do that, David, can I just yeah. thank you, Rachel, because I think she needs to hop off. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you for having me. And if anyone has any questions, um, I have my Twitter DMs are open, so feel free to uh, hit me up there. Oh, I'll post my link in the thing. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, David. So if we were looking at someone who's a who's more experienced, they've already been working in, in a field, you know, data science related or as a data scientist, but they wanna they wanna also improve their um, their abilities and you know maybe their work has sort of uh, tanked in sense in the sense that they're not doing anything new but they wanna they wanna always keep their game up you know how would you change your advice for someone who's at that level yeah um, you know maybe this is unfortunate because I, I like high tech stuff. Um, one of the trends that's happening, which I think is is, which I'm seeing, but is not widely known, is um, like getting better and better at some types of machine learning. It does not seem to be the hot thing in demand right now. Um, most businesses that I talk to are realizing, hey, we were building stuff in notebooks. And that was great for experiments, but now we actually need to do some like software engineering around that. And the thing that people have historically said is, oh, well, I'm a data scientist in a software engineer, like that's for the engineers to deal with. Um, I'd have to think about like, I might be able to think of some people who are still able to do that, but almost everyone I know is now at a point where they need to create code that's reusable. They're gonna to need to collaborate with people. As soon as you're talking about collaborating, it's I need my code to be um, something that other people can can run, other people can understand. Um, you know, if you're in a notebook, it's quite common for people to like copy and paste something from one part of the notebook to the next um, and not put it, not put stuff in functions. And uh, yeah, a few years ago you could get by with that. Um, I think I think that's ceasing to be the case. And so to an addition to saying, I'm gonna be a data scientist, I understand how to visualize stuff, I understand statistics, I understand machine learning better than others. I think that um, you can't go down the road of being just that without also being a reasonably good programmer um, for too long. Um, so I, I would say get better at, get better at writing software and, and software that's good enough that you can collaborate with others. Um, for a hobbyist, like one way to do that is just collaborate with others. Like you don't realize how much better code needs to be when you collaborate until you actually do it. Um, so I, I would say that's part of it. And then the other, the other part is something I mentioned earlier, which is um, try and think really rigorously about um, how you go from, I've got a model, we're gonna sort of guess about what the right thing to do is with the outputs to what are the ways that I can really rigorously um, make sure we're using, if, if I'm building machine learning models, I can be really rigorous about um, making sure we're efficiently turning those into to the right business decisions. Great. Ryan, anything to add? Yeah, uh, it, it was interesting to, to hear Dan say that. I um, have heard a lot of the same stuff recently too, just about um, how I think I've heard that the next big thing is going to be um, 
moving uh, machine learning and data science out of notebooks and, and into production. And I think there's a lot of, uh, it sounds like there's a lot of development going on in, in, in that space now. Um, so I think that'll probably be, um, be big in demand uh, in the future. Um, as far as developing your skills, um, I think sort of the uh, same thing, just find a, you know, a project that's interesting to work on and, um, you know, there's tons of stuff out there and, uh, yeah. <laughs> Great, thanks. Robert, you want to follow? Uh, sure. Are we are we ready for the open floor now, or were there other questions that we needed to to go through? I think we're good for opening it up. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so I imagine there are a number of you that that may have questions you'd like to ask. Uh, please uh, feel free to unmute yourselves as as appropriate to uh, to communicate. Um. I had a quick question just to follow up on what Ryan was speaking about. Um, you mentioned sort of data science at production level, sort of moving away from those notebooks. Um, in the in the Kaggle realm, is is Kaggle thinking about whether in courses or um, like like how is Kaggle thinking about that problem, if if at all, or how would you uh, think about that? Yeah. Uh... That's an, an interesting question. Uh, I, as far as I know, there aren't any um, concrete plans to uh, sort of do stuff out, outside of, of, of notebooks at this point. Um, I, I do know some people who uh, are really involved in competitions uh, do some more of the, a little bit more on the software engineering side as far as uh, like experiment tracking and they kind of have these frameworks set up and all, and all that kind of thing. Um, it's not something I actually have a, a, a whole lot of experience with, um, but uh, yeah, I, I hear that it's 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 important. Though. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Anybody else has any questions? There's some great questions on the chat. I highly encourage you to unmute yourself, and maybe post them, um, just just so that we can ask from clarification questions. Can I can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm new to data science and I was wondering if there are any companies that we can work on their project, which is real. And then even like for a part-time internship, do you have any suggestions like where we can find these companies or maybe startup companies, not for, you know, for the money aspect, but for the experience aspect? That's, that's such a good question, and I wish I had a, a better answer. The real answer is I don't know. Um, I do think that one of the strengths of Kaggle is that it has just a bunch of free data sets. And so while it is not the same, um, and you don't get, you know, some of the benefits you get from a real project is you're insured that it's something that you're producing something of value and that it's like the right type of, of work. Um, but, and the other is that you get feedback. Kaggle does have a lot of data sets, if you find a topic that's interesting to you, um, I would say, given that I can't give you the answer to what you actually asked, I would say a quite reasonable thing is um, uh, is to find a topic that's interesting to you and then do some analytics using, go find a data set on Kaggle um, and then uh, publish it and try and get feedback, share it on Kaggle, try and get feedback on it. Um, the other thing which I've seen, uh, you know, if you're comfortable doing this, see if you can present it at a meetup. Um, and I, if, I, if I were in your shoes and I said, this guy doesn't know how to find a company that will let me do that, I think the, the backup thing that I would consider would be um, to do a project, see if I can present it at the meetup, and then at the end of my presentation say, hey, I'm willing to do this on a either volunteer basis or whatever the, it is. And now you know, there is an extra step there, but now however many people, 40, 50 people just saw, all right, she did a project, she can actually do it. And now she's willing to do something like that for us. And that might be, that might be sort of the, the path to get there. Thank you. Hi, I, I just wanted to take a moment to uh, thank the Kaggle folks. 
Um, I got an email notification a while back about your outreach for uh, BIPOC people uh, trying to increase diversity. Um, I thought that was a pretty awesome. Um, I think one of the challenges is, of course, you know, I'm an old embedded systems programmer, um, and I and I do try to do mentorship, but I think getting people, you know, ingested uh, in seems to be the challenge. And you know, I was just wondering how that uh, program was going, and again, wanted to thank you for having the courage to try it. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, that's something that uh, we uh, we talk a lot about. And it's been a, a, a big focus lately is uh, trying to um, increase diversity at Kaggle and uh, help develop the community and um, and just bring a, a, a wider range of people in. Um, so I I personally haven't been involved with um, that program a whole lot, but I, I know that. Uh, um, it's a it's a focus of a lot of the stuff that we're doing. Um, I believe Google is, is um, doing some stuff with uh, uh, certification and that kind of thing that might be of, of interest. But um, yeah, so uh, I, I feel like I'm not giving a great answer to your question. But yeah, I know it's something that we 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 care about a lot and we're um, we're we're working on improving. Thanks. I just wanted to say it was noticed. And appreciate it. And if I was 30 years younger, <laughs> right. <laughs> I wanted to circle back to uh, Tamina's question as well, because I think uh, one thing that I can add to the answers that were provided is that there are a lot of opportunities out there to uh, collaborate on projects through things like hackathons or other organizations. Um, I know we have one here in DC, Data Kind. Um, there's a democracy lab, um, a variety of organizations you can find out where there's a lot of uh, uh, projects with uh, opportunities for open source collaboration. Uh, so you can almost certainly browse through the types of things that are being pursued there right now and find something that's really interesting to you. And usually there's various tasks that need to be done and you can find one that fits your, uh, your skill set and, uh, and learning goals as well. Thank you. So I'll, I'll jump in there with a question. Uh, one of the, the topics that was discussed was the growing need to operationalize and really put, you know, put machine learning models, put deep learning, put data science into production so that it can deliver business value. My question is how, how do we, you know, convince, communicate to businesses that that takes an entire team, not just an individual, not just a unicorn, because the number of tools that it takes to really put a, you know, a fully scalable machine, lear you know, machine learning system into production in a scalable way, that takes a huge amount of effort, huge amount of skills. How, you know, how do we resist the urge to learn everything while also learning everything? Yeah, um, there are a few parts. I, I guess there are a few ways to think about that question. Um, I'm not, I, this, this is another one where I'm not going to have a great answer. Um, uh, some, one of the things that I see, let's see, is um, even before we put a machine learning model into production, I frequently see data scientists who do something in a notebook and it can't even be rerun on a regular basis. So, uh, you know, something in the schema changes or they've hard coded a file name so that they they literally can't send it to someone else and say, run this. Um, uh, and so even before that, I'd say, all right, can you create, can we create, you know, dashboards aren't sexy, but can I create a dashboard that is maybe a, got a, a flask app? If I go to it day after day after day, if it ran yesterday, it will run today. Um, so that that's something that uh, quite surprisingly is uh, missing, I think, in a lot of data science. Um, for a lot of data scientists, you know, how do we go? From, how do we go from that to the next step? Um, all to deploy a machine learning model. I think a big part of it is being able to translate the uh, the result of using a machine learning model 
into literal dollars in a compelling way. And so, um, you know, I, sometimes sometimes I'll see you know data scientists will say, hey, if we use this model, then um, we'll be three percent more accurate in identifying which customers we're going to churn. And then, you know, it, if you didn't know anything about how accuracy is even defined, you say, God, should we hire someone for a three percent improvement on churn? I don't know. And if instead you could push that a step further and say, you know, the customer lifetime value for these for these for these people for these customers that don't churn is whatever it is, and you could say, hey, we're going to save five hundred thousand dollars a year by putting this model into production, and I think it's going to require one ML engineer. Now you take that to someone and say, hey, are you willing to spend two hundred k on a salary so that you can save five hundred k a year? That's a much easier argument to make. Um, and then there's some analysis. I happen to think that the tool I've developed is the optimal tool, or not the optimal tool, but the best tool available in 2021 for how you go for, from, if we deploy this and use a given rule for, for how we make decisions based on the predictions, what will the bottom line Im impact be? But you could even do that in most cases like with Excel and going that extra step so that someone, you can convince someone, not just tell them, but convince them that here's the, here's the dollars the you know dollars and cents it's gonna it's gonna show up on our our p l statement our profit and loss statement like that's when you um that's when you are getting closer to they're actually gonna be willing to invest in um yeah how do you convince them that it can't all be done by one person i don't i don't have the answer for that you you tell them and hopefully they believe you um yeah someone mentioned streamlet which i'm a huge fan of um, especially for for dashboards, um, yeah, is not a is not a solution for deploying models at scale. But it, yeah, Streamlit is a really cool tool for making something that people can interact with and even like get a sense for what would it look like to um, to use this. Thank you. Any other questions from anyone? Up the floor. I have a question actually. Um, so, uh, my first question is to Ryan. Um, I was wondering, because when I see Kaggle courses, the main main topic that are missing in general, almost every machine learning engineer or someone who is interested in machine learning uh, doing, I don't see any unsupervised learning course in Kaggle. I think maybe even a simple course might help people. Like it could have been like PCA or K-means or any other ones. And in other courses, I was wondering if you're planning in the future is RNNs because recurrent neural networks are almost one of the most important and powerful deep learning um, models. And it works in many cases. It could have been, you know, NLP or time series. And I feel these are really important topics. I was just wondering if Kaggle is planning to make courses, especially RNNs, even though it's really easy to build using TensorFlow framework, but deep inside is pretty complicated to understand, especially how those um, internal, internal parameters work in terms of LSTM models and bi bi-directional LSTM models. And the second question, I was actually planning to same, ask same thing, since uh, as Dan also mentioned that machine learning or data science is evolving to deployment site more often. So I see in job descriptions, there are so many tools required recently, and the number of tools re required are growing exponentially. I'm a new graduate. I, I almost learn all, all of these and now I see every single day I need to learn something new within a month. Now there's like Docker and Kubernetes is really popular and similarly Flask and tools that you use to deploy your models are getting really popular. So how would you, what would you suggest to candidates that, that are trying to start a career? what would you suggest them to do in terms of learning tools? Because if you don't include some percentage of those tools in your resume, 
you know, by ATS, you will be rejected. And there's no way, even if you you have really impressive um, resume, the hiring manager will see your resume. So what, what do you suggest for, in terms of learning tools and how to catch up with these technologies? Yeah, um, as far as the, the courses go, uh, all the things you mentioned are, are, are things that we uh, definitely want to do. Um, it's mostly just a matter of um, how, how fast can we write them. <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, feature engineering we have coming out, a uh, time series, which is gonna be um, sort of a machine learning focused course. We think uh, we're still designing that one. Um, but then we'd, we'd like to do time series with, with deep learning at some point. Um, and probably we'd use the uh, RNNs. Current there. Yeah, the RNNs there. Um, we'd, we'd love to do something on uh, language models at some point. So, you know, transformers. Um, and then, uh, yeah, so there's uh, machine learning. There's a, a ton out there and we'd like to, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get to most of it at, at some point. Um, but uh, on your, your second point, uh, yeah, so I've um, noticed the, the same thing. I, I think that it seems like machine learning now because it's it's so new there's all these tools that are coming out and there's you know thousands of new frameworks and thousands more every year um and as far as getting a a, a job goes my experience has been that um tossing a, a resume up on linkedin or whatever is kind of just tossing it into the void um, I've, I've never gotten a, a job that way i don't know if we've ever, ever gotten an interview that way um, but uh, as far as like getting your, your foot in the door and getting the interview, um, I think like what's been successful for me is just uh, like putting work out there, um, going to meetups, giving talks, um, just like meeting people. And uh, I think um, something that uh, uh, Rachel had said, like they, they want to know that you can do the job before they hire you. Um, and one of the ways that they know that is because that you've like given talks at meetups or you have you know projects on your GitHub and, and things like that. Um, and a lot of times the conversation will just turn into, well, you know, you did this really cool thing, by the way. Like, like uh, I know somebody who like maybe you could, um, you know, who maybe could use you. Would you be interested in talking to them? Um, that kind of thing. Um, but then, like as far as what to focus on, I mean, I think it's just like find something you're interested in and, and learn it and uh, usually whatever framework they're using, um, realistically, you're probably going to learn it on the job anyway. So, um, yeah, I think that's uh, that's been my experience. OK, thank you. Yeah, uh, and I'd, I'd mostly agree with that. And I've, I've even been part of this phenomenon of like, we're going to list PyTorch and TensorFlow and, and Keras. We're going to list three of them in a job description. Like, we actually don't need you. Like, you don't need to know nearly as larger fraction of those tools as um as you think um but my my concern was in terms of ats because if you you don't include keywords in your resume you know then that's, especially that's, if you don't know anyone in the company you have really little chance that's my yeah I, I i totally i totally see that problem uh for better or for worse ryan is right that if you end up as one one automatically submitted resume among uh, you know 100 or 500 um if you end up with one automatically submitted resume among 100 you'd think all right now i have a one percent chance of getting that job you know from a and it, it's actually worse than that because the thing that happens is someone at the, uh, so i'm hiring i say i'm gonna put that job posting out there because it doesn't cost me anything to do it I'm going to get these pile of resumes. I can't tell a good person from a bad person when I get these resumes. So in addition to putting that out, I'm also going to go through my network and find people who I've worked with in the past to figure out, because I know, you know I've know i worked with them. I know if they're good or not. And um, yeah, the, the things that are going to, the, the thing, the person I'm going to end up hiring is frequently going to come not through an automated system, but it's going to be, uh, I saw um i saw someone's presentation i thought it was interesting or i did a google search because i was curious about forest fires then i found this analysis about like the data science of forest fires and i was like that guy's awesome 
I'm going to like tell, uh, I'm going to tell him, Hey, by the way, if you're looking for a job, we're hiring. Um, and then the resume is almost like an afterthought. I'll say like, Hey, here's how you need to apply, but then email me back once you've applied. Um, and I really have hired through the, through, I've even hired for, um, uh, Kaggle learn by like going out and finding people who had done really cool blog posts. Um, and then sourcing through that. And yeah, unfortunately, like apply, applying and hoping that your resume stands out in the stack of resumes that we get is uh, a really hard way to do it. Okay, thank you. Great questions. I have a couple of questions, but I wanna make sure everybody else has the chance to ask. So I'll go ahead, feel free to unmute yourself. Dan, a quick question. You you said that you had a you developed a software for effectively doing uh, business cases for AI and ML. Uh, just wonder if you could say what it is or put it in the chat. Yeah, uh, the company is called Decision AI. It's Decision AI. Um, it's a small company, so the website is not uh, website is not great. Um, if you if anyone emails me, Dan at Decision AI. I'll email you um, or a link to our documentation, a link to somewhere you can just start using it. You know, it's a, right now we're just getting people on the software so I can set you up with an account, um, send you a video about how to use it um, because, yeah. So anyways, it's called Decision AI. It's a, a web-based app and okay. um, anyone who follows up with me, I'll, I'll help you get started. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll reach out to you separately. Awesome. I actually teach finance classes and good place for it. People ask for that yep. sort of software. Yeah, and in the decision that Dan you, you held a couple of weeks ago or a week ago, and I, I enjoyed it very much. So feel free to check it out. I posted the link on our chat. Cool. Any more questions? In the meantime, I'm gonna ask you, uh, Dan Ryan, what is your uh, what is your opinion on um, certificates on certifications? It could be cloud providers, could be machine learning providers. Um, how helpful they are, or most importantly to me, how helpful is the journey of getting such a certificate towards either getting a new role or, or improving your, your, your programming skills or data science skills? Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to, I've, I've never done one of these certificate programs, so I'm gonna have to plead ignorance and <laughs> and I don't know. No problem. Uh, I'm going to say the same thing. I, I've never done a certificate either. Uh, I, I would think of it um, probably the same as um, as taking a course. I mean, if it helps you to learn something, um, like I think that would that would be a good motivation. Um, as far as how valuable it is for getting hired, I, I suspect it depends a lot on the company. Um, uh, but uh, again, I, um, I've seen that like projects and like actual like unique work is, is typically a lot more valuable. So if you're prioritizing how you're going to spend your time, um, you know, I, I would say like do original work, original work over certificates, but that, that's been my experience anyway. Got it. That's useful. And one more follow-up question to, to both of you. Um, this is related to Kaggle competitions. Um, as many of you have noticed, it's relatively doable to achieve a reasonably uh, a reasonable result. But then I think to me from my experience gets like a, there's a quadratic cost just for that extra 1% improvement, 2% improvement, you have to spend like X square in terms of energy and, and, and feature engineering or what it is. Um, is there any, is that the nature of, of just uh, the competition itself or uh, is there any, any other approach you think we should tackle this challenge of I mean, 90, 90%, how do I get to 92%? How do I get to 92% accuracy, for example? Yeah, it's, uh, it is really hard to, it, it gets progressively harder as you go higher up the leaderboard. The people at the top, in addition to um, having a lot of, in addition to being smart people, they have built up a library of tools that they reuse from one um, contest to the next. Uh, and they've also built up a library of just like skills that they reuse from one contest to the next. So that, um, yeah, it's, it's just super hard to 
to get in the top. Um, let's see. So there are some tools. That, there are some techniques that you would not read about outside of Kaggle that are probably pretty useful. So one is um, uh, it gets used in a, a few different senses, but there's something called leaderboard probing, um, which is to say, all right, so uh, you get a training data set. It's got, I don't know, 100,000 um, 100, records. In addition to that, you've got the test set, which you're going to submit. Let's say it's got another 100,000 records. Um, typically, we say, all right, I'm going to I'm going to use just the training set to build my model. Really, the total amount of information I get is is 100,000 records worth of information. Every time you submit data to the um, to the leaderboard, you get a score from that, and from that you can actually sort of suck out some of the information by knowing, all right. Um, yeah, you, you can sort of you can get some information about the leaderboard through this type of, of probing. Um, and there are a lot of tricks around that, which are not useful outside of Kaggle. But um, uh, let me let me give you a couple of example of more concrete examples. So let's say you're in a competition and the um, this is a special, sorry, let me back up the the Probing techniques are sort of useful um, in, in all competitions, but they're especially useful if you have a competition where the test set is from a different period of time. So let's say it's like a later period in time than the training set. Mm -hmm. So you know, there's a potential that, um, yeah, that's just different because the world changes. If your model metric is accuracy, you can submit something where all your predictions or ones, just ones across the board. You can figure out what your accuracy is. And now that tells you in the test set, what's the actual number, what's the actual number of ones and what's the actual number of zeros. And it could be different than it is in the training set. And now you'll build a machine learning model. You'll do that with your training data set, but you can do some like post hoc adjust adjustments before submitting it so that if the actual um, you know if the actual fraction of of uh, of images that are in, that are for which the answer is true like if that's actually higher in the test set than it was in the training set you can make little adjustments that will I mean just mathematically tautologically improve your score um, if you do a little bit of linear algebra you'll see that you can do the same thing um, in regression problems. Um, so that you can make these sort of like, after I've built my model, before I submit, I make these adjustments. Um, it's called leaderboard probing. Some people do it in a way that, um, yeah, that, that gets a little, uh, some people do it in a way that is really um, extreme. It's hard to compete with those people. Sometimes they do it in a way that will not generalize to the private leaderboard. Uh, which is something that, that Robert mentioned. But in a lot of cases, you know, so this competition that I did was um, you get patient medical records for years one, two, and three. And then you've got, um, you've got, you're predicting how many days people will spend in the hospital in year four. If year four, you know, it's a different year. Um, all of of them one. And so for each of these different demographic groups, I could calculate what's the actual um, mean value for days in the hospital in year four. Um, and even though they keep a private leaderboard, the fact that you're now getting data from, in addition to years one through three, you're actually getting data about year four, like there's, that's, you're just gonna do much better. And there's, you know, that probably, we finished in second place. If we didn't do that leaderboard probing, uh, I bet we would have been in like 300th place. Um, and so you just can't compete with, if you don't know some of like the Kaggle specific tricks, it's gonna be super hard to compete with people who do. Mm -hmm. um, in cases where the, the, um, the data on the test set is pulled out of the same period of time as the training data, 
there, I think the thing that you see is people do leader is do this leaderboard probing. They trust their probing too much, and then when they use then when they reveal the private leaderboard, those people drop a bunch. You know, see a lot of people who are experienced cagglers say you should trust your your cross validation. Um, yeah, and so it varies from competition to competition, but trusting cross validation uh, is frequently is depending on the competition makes sense, but doing some of this leaderboard probing um, sometimes is necessary and other times it's just a little beneficial. Um, if you're currently just doing for your local training, this sort of like train validation holdout split or, or train holdout split, um, making sure you retrain on 100% of your data is valuable. Make sure you're doing cross validation instead of just conventional validation is, uh, is always better because it gives you a more reliable score. Um, those are the things that come to mind. But yeah, it the amount of effort, the amount of effort to go from top fifty percent to top ten percent is just a lot more effort. And then top ten percent to top one percent is much more effort. And then top one percent to top five teams is a lot more effort. Got it. Thank you, Dan. That was very useful. Brian, do you have anything to? Uh add to that yeah um just a, a, a couple of things from uh, my observations uh on uh, tabular data sets anyway um i've noticed that the uh, uh the top competitors often have really smart feature engineering mm -hmm. um good uh, cross validation schemes um, so they have a lot of confidence in their um in their decisions um, and then ensembling also um, always seems to give you a, a boost of a few percent at least. Um, yeah. So um, we'd like to do a, a course on some of the advanced techniques at some point. So maybe we'll get that on, on Kaggle Learn too. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, Meg, I should have mentioned that. Ensembling is, you know, to be towards the top, you're typically ensembling like 100 models or something. So um, ensembling helps a bunch. Cool. Any questions from, uh, from our members, our community? Feel free to unmute yourself. I'll ask uh, one more question. Sorry. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Merlin. Really. All right. Uh, give me a second. All right. There you go. Um, uh, well, first, I want to say thank you um, for your time and advice. Um, I'm currently doing my PhD in information system security, and uh, I have uh, more than almost 10 years in IT experience. Uh, but uh, lately, I've been uh, more interested toward data science, uh, learning more toward that. Uh, I've been teaching uh, an IT of almost now three years. Um, as a part-time professor at uh, Bellevue University. Uh, but um, I've been looking into um, more data science internship, uh, like one of the participants asked earlier. Um, I know how hard that is uh, to find an internship because it's, it could be, there might be some data that are more related to, uh, you know, secure, uh, security, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but as even with IT professionals, uh, with your self experience, what would you recommend? Like for instance, I did my master's in database system technology and, and I have experience with R programming, uh, a lot of data, uh, data database programming, uh, like uh, programming language. Um, I was looking into the, uh, the website and the courses and um, uh, I've seen some of the courses, what they what they're require, but um, what would you say? Uh, that I should invest or someone who's trying to get into more data science field to master first? Should I look into and invest more, most of my time toward Python um, or any other programming language? How do, how do we start to shift toward data science? Um, uh, that, that's my question. Yeah, I, I couldn't say this when Rachel was, uh, was on the, the webinar because she feels differently, but uh, I would say there's, there's no question that Python is the dominant language of, of data scientists. Uh, I think when I left Kaggle, uh, something like 94, 95% of, of kernels or notebooks that got written were in R and that was increasing. 
um, over time rather than decreasing. Um, you know, you, so you'll want to know SQL as well, but, but I would say it's super important to know Python. Um, the other thing that I would emphasize is if you've worked in, in IT security, there's uh, a lot of work that's going on at the intersection of machine learning or data science and um, information security. And so well, if you say, hey, I'm going to be a sort of generic data scientist, you are one of many. <clears throat> if you come in and say, hey, I'm, I'm going to do data science related to for security applications, well, now you, know, you have experience. You're one of a relatively few. Um, there's like, there's some super interesting stuff there. There's like a CAGA competition a while ago that was um, uh, running machine learning on code to tell if it's malware. So I think of that as like a, a quite interesting competition. Um, yeah, there's a bunch of stuff about looking at related to security permissions. Um, yeah, so I, I would try and get involved in, in that space, you know, trying to do something that's adjacent, that's moving towards what you want, but it's adjacent to what you do now. Um, if in the short run, that means you're doing a lot of data visualization, but you're doing it in Python um, in order to help the security applications, I think that is the right way, the right sort of like transition strategy. So that would be my primary recommendation in terms of courses, um, you know, we're obviously big fans of, of Kaggle Learn. I would start with, uh, if you don't know Python, I would start with our Python course and our machine learning course, um, and then our data viz course. Um, yeah, and then, uh, sorry, someone, a couple, I see it in the comments. I, I did mean to say 95% of Kaggle notebooks are in Python. I did not mean to say R. Careful there, Dan. <laughs> yeah, 5% are, 5 or so are in R or that was the number uh, earlier. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, this is Alexandra. I have a question. So how are companies starting to use reinforcement learning in machine learning projects since it's, I guess, a new hot area of ML? And then my follow-up is how are they bringing these RL models to production since they're a little bit different than your classical supervised and unsupervised algorithms? Yeah, I'm. Um, I'm really. Yeah, I've historically been very excited about reinforcement learning. Um, you know, the the problem that uh, that I talked about, which uh, earlier, which is you know the, the core thing my company does, um, is you know the core thing that we do is to go from you've got a machine learning model that makes a prediction. I'm claiming that those predictions typically are not enough to make good decisions. That's for exactly the, the reason of reinforcement learning that reinforcement learning exists, which is most decisions they play out in a, a series of periods. The right price for us to set, if we are setting airline prices, the right price we set today is going to depend on what we would do tomorrow, and that's going to have an impact on what happens the next day. So these sorts of dynamics are super important um, in most real world problems. Reinforcement learning is absolutely the, the tool to do that. And yet, um, I would, uh, I can say with a pretty high, uh, you know, as a quite good approximation, reinforcement learning is just not being deployed anywhere today. Um, there are some minor exceptions, like within Google, um, which is you know, probably the most, uh, is probably responsible for like, I don't know, a quarter of all of the world's reinforcement learning research. Um, within Google, there are isolated places where it's getting used. So it was getting used in Project Loon, which was about um, you know navigating these balloons so that just got shut down. It got used um, in, uh, it got used in something about data center cooling. Um, but even at Google, it was used less than 1% as much as just supervised machine learning. And then if you go outside of Google, um, I don't, I'm not super close to what's happening in Facebook, but uh, yeah, if you were to say in an insurance company or financial services or, or anywhere like that, they quite simply are not using uh, reinforcement learning in my view, unfortunately, but that's, that's just where they are. So then as a follow-up, what do you view as the challenges to deploying reinforcement learning? Great. Um, okay, so let me break that into two parts. So first is what is the, 
challenge to training reinforcement learning? And then what is the challenge to getting your model deployed? So they, there's a challenge which isn't totally obvious uh, to many people who are not close to the field, which is um, reinforcement learning has high, we'll call it sample complexity. So you need, you're going to build a model that is going to be terrible at something for the first approximately billion times it does it. And then it's going to start to get good. So if you are training a reinforcement learning model at Go, you can have it, let's say, play itself. So this is what um, AlphaGo Zero does. And it's terrible at it for several billion games, but it can just play itself you know, <laughs> billions of times in a day. And then at the end of the day, OK, it's good. Um, if you are, you know, if we went through where is reinforcement learning, like what are the cases where it's known to be successful? It was AlphaGo Zero. Um, OpenAI had uh, this thing that played the video game Dota really well. So it, you're bad at Dota for a long time. And eventually after playing Dota, it's good at Dota. Um, you know, this is the, the Andre Carpathy did something with some other video game. But there aren't that many real world situations where, you're, where you can say, we're willing to make the wrong decision a billion times so that we'll have a program that can start making the right decision. Um, the approach that we're taking at, at Decision AI is to build um, simulators. Uh, so that's, we wanna build a really good simulation of your real world airline pricing system or your real world um, inventory management system. And that's gonna be bringing together multiple machine learning models and other domain knowledge. Um, yeah, someone mentioned this, this some, of, some of it is happening in robotics, but even like the teams that are most, you know, Boston Dynamics does not use reinforcement learning. So there's some of it happening in robotics. And I think that's the area where, um, where we see the, uh, the most progress on uh, building a simulator, having a reinforcement learning model learn in the simulator, and then apply it to the real world. Um, if you wanted to read up on that, the problem that they struggle with is something called Sim2Real, so S-I-M, the number two, and then R-E-A-L. And there's a whole research literature about, literature, um, about that uh, that are related to, we train something in a simulator, our simulator is imperfect, what happens when we deploy it in reality. Um, so so the, the primary challenge is like, we can't even train very good reinforcement learning models for problems that we don't have a great simulator. In most cases, the only place we have a good simulator is, is games. And then who cares if we're good at games? Um, yeah, and then you know the second part of that is like, if we did have a good agent, what's the challenge to getting it deployed? Um, yeah, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll leave that, maybe I won't even go into that uh, because it's, it's been done infrequently enough that even as someone who like tries to read about it, um, my take is like every time it happens is um, is like a bespoke engineering challenge. Um, the places that I've seen it done use a library called Ray, R-A-Y, which I've never personally used. Um, yeah, and the, the thing that that we're doing is the thing that we're doing is to have um, functions that are that are solving reinforcement learning problems, but there's simpler Python functions um, than like a deep reinforcement learning like uh, model would give you, um, which makes the deployment a little bit easier. You can pickle it and deploy it like many other um, RESTful API Python functions. But even just getting like a, a real reinforcement learning, or a useful reinforcement learning model for a real problem is hard because it's hard to get the right simulator. Thank you. I was thinking about doing a reinforcement learning task, but then I found it realized a fatal flaw in the design. So probably might not use it. Yeah. I mean, uh, the other the other thing to think about is um, reinforcement learning today is associated with like deep reinforcement learning. So A2C or A3C. Um, uh, but you know, if you went back five years when people were thinking about reinforcement learning, they were thinking about, uh, it, it, so there are a bunch of other reinforcement learning-like approaches that don't require 
a deep learning model, they sometimes have better sample complexity. There's a Kaggle Learn course about it, um, about reinforcement learning for, again, for games. But if you can get a good simulator, I don't know. I, I'm always excited about the topic, so. Yeah. So then I guess my follow-up question, would you argue that if you can simplify your problem and use a simple RL model, like a classical model, um, would you recommend that over like deep learning? Um, because it's, I don't know, would it take less time to converge? It, uh, it's probably gonna, it's probably gonna depend on so many factors that, um, uh, that I don't have a single answer for that. The, the big problem is always, can I go to get, get a good simulator? You know, one of the interesting facts, and, and I apologize, uh, you've got me on a topic that I think is so interesting. And if, if you say what's gonna be useful over the next one or two years is probably not reinforcement learning. But if so, what's gonna be important 10 years from now, I'm convinced re reinforcement learning will be the most important um, thing that we work on today. Um, and so you, I have a tendency to sort of get carried away. You know, one of the one of the phenomena that you see with reinforcement learning is that let's say we do it in a simulator, there's always some error in like what uh, the difference between what happened in the simulator versus what would happen in reality. And to some extent, that happens even if you have access to to reality of like you just get lucky in one or two um, times that you like operate on reality. So, but let's say we, we run this in a simulator. Our simulator is not perfect. So sometimes our error is positive, sometimes it's negative. If you always take the action that is most, that has like sort of the highest score, that's typically gonna be something where you just, you sort of got lucky because there's so many ways you can get lucky. And if you, if you did something that got the worst score, that's gonna be somewhere that um, typically you got unlucky. And so these reinforcement learning models, if you have a simulator that's imperfect, um, the actions that it takes are frequently going to be those where your simulator was least accurate. And that's like systematically the case. And so uh, the challenge, whether you, and that's gonna be the case, whether you use a deep learning model for, for generating the, um, the actions or whether you use something sim simpler, um, the challenge is, right now is um, how do I get a simulator that is good? Um, and then how do I make sure that I'm cautious about how I generalize from the simulator to reality? And that's gonna be just, that's gonna be probably more important than what you're using for, to actually generate the actions. Um, I, would, I would probably use something simpler to actually generate the actions because it's not the most important part. You want something that runs quickly. Um, but I, I think the thing to, to really think most deeply about is like, how do I get a good simulator and make sure that the places where it's, it's not perfect um, are things I'm protected from. Awesome, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Ryan. Uh, last question. Um, if there are no questions, I think we're going to wrap up here. I know we've went a little bit over time, so I appreciate you know your your patience and uh, sticking with us all the way to the end. Um, let's see a lot of chat here. Great. I think it's about time to wrap up. Then let me share my screen real quick. And again, thank you, Dan. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, this has been a great conversation. Uh, looking forward to having you maybe sometime in the future. Um, uh, it's been really informative for us and, and it, it brought many communities together. So I wanna thank you again. Uh, again, special thanks to all the different communities that have cross-posted this event. Uh, it wouldn't be possible without you. Um, I'll post the links as well here. Great job on the Kaggle Learns here. We will learn a lot. Looking forward to the new feature, Ryan, on feature engineering. <laughs> this event will be posted on our, uh, on our YouTube playlist here. As you've seen, we've been pretty busy covering each and uh, every section and uh, we'll be posted here. I shared the link on our, on our chat as well. Um, if you wanna join us for our next session, we have uh, a deep learning day trip. Robert's gonna lead a, a bike share project he worked in the past, as well as an app he built uh, doing, uh, doing prediction of demand uh, and of different bikes in the, this area. After that, I think the last section we have to, we need to cover is the, the intelligent bots navigating space. That's the very last one. 
as part of the Kaggle Learn series, and that will wrap up uh, our Kaggle Learn adventures. Um, I just have a chart here of the that exponentially harder uh, problem that I was telling you about. This is really related to the uh, metal to the pedal to the metal competition for uh, flower classification. As you've seen, I've tried different models. I'll post a link as well. But um, once I introduce a new feature, I'm able to jump, but then it levels off my performance. This is validation accuracy. And so far for me, things that have worked are either a larger model or maybe some fine tuning on hyperparameter training uh, or maybe doing ensemble models and obviously more data that also gave me a boost. And that's the decision I linked that uh, Dan shared with us and Ryan, if you have any links, feel free to share them with us. Again, I'll stop sharing here. I wanna thank you again, Dan and Ryan and Rachel. Thank you for joining us. It's been great. Um, thank you again. Yeah, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank My you. pleasure, thank you all for, for having me. It's been great. Thank you so much. I mean, so worth us. Everyone for your time. Thank you friends for joining us. Right. I'll stop the recording here, but I'll leave the Zoom channel open in case you wanna hang out later. But thanks again, everyone.